through us. She's been staying at here at the youth meeting center, as you might have noticed for already for a couple of days. She's been meeting different groups, especially groups from Germany. She came to, uh, here to us from Warsaw, where she currently lives, and uh, she will be answering your questions. So we'll have kind of an interview. Uh, as you know, because I know you've all read the biography of Mrs. Posmesh, she was born in the year 1923 in a district of Krakow, where she also went to school and then to a trade school. Um, but during the war time, she had to interrupt her, um, her learning like many other young people in Poland. Then she was arrested and deported to the camp, first to the camp of Auschwitz, then to the camp of Birkenau. Uh, and I know you have prepared questions concerning uh, the time before the war, the war time, as well as the time in the years after the war. So please try to put your questions, ask your questions in a relatively chronological order so that we can have some chronological guideline to follow. So we are waiting for your questions. We would like to hear something about your family history and yeah, who your family was. Bardzo chętnie. Yes, I would love to. Mój tata był kolejarzem, zacznijmy od tego. Um, my father worked at the, for the railways. Uh, we had a little house in a district that was built for railway employees um, and he uh, worked with Yes, yeah, so he worked at the railway, basically. My mama była urodzoną wieśniaczką, można powiedzieć. Pochodziła z takiej wioski. My mother came from a little and very picturesque village, um, a couple of kilometers away from Krakow, and she was a housewife. Do wybuchu wojny ja ja uczęszczałam. And until the war broke out, I um, visited a middle school. Uh, it was a trading school. I was 16 when the German army marched into Krakow and uh, immediately all the universities and all the higher schools were closed. Even those schools uh, who had, um, even schools that uh, prepared for different jobs. So my school was closed as well. Zapomniałam jeszcze powiedzieć, to proszę uzupełnić, że... Uh, I had two sisters, one older sister and one younger sister, as well as one younger brother. In 1939 was for me uh, the year when my whole world collapsed for the first time. Before the war, uh, schools were teaching um, young people not only uh, not only the school things but also patriotism but also love for our country and we were all convinced this, that this country we were born in that had been under foreign control for so many years and that we have been fighting so so much for that this country is going to develop is going to become a wealthy and powerful country for young people of my age or you know, those who are a bit older and stayed at universities, all came to an end all of a sudden. There were no possibilities uh, to continue education anymore. And the only work that uh, we could do was the work that the Germans told us to do. And in order to be assigned some work, you had to go to the so-called Arbeitsamt, the employment, the German employment office. Ci, którzy tego nie zrobili, nie mieli zaświadczenia, że zameldowali się w kraju. Those who didn't do it, those who didn't register with the employment office and had no other uh, job in the country were sent to Germany to perform forced labor. No, żeby... And so in order to avoid deportation to, to Germany, I registered with the uh, employment office and I got a, a job assigned. 
Dlatego, że miałam trochę ze szkoły, znałam trochę język niemiecki. And because I had learned a little bit of German at school, back then it was the only foreign language that we could learn uh, in school. Um, I got a job as a waiter in a German casino. Było to korzystne. And this was a good job because not only I wasn't hungry myself, but I also could sometimes take some food from this casino and bring it home because uh, there was a great hunger in the country at that time already. We had this. Um, we had these food charts, so these food bonds um, that uh, we could exchange against food, but there weren't enough and people were hungry, people were undernutritioned. I also got the chance to continue my education after all. Already in 1940, a system of secret schools was created, which gave young people the opportunity to continue their education in almost any chosen direction. And the secret schools were a part of the uh, underground, were a part of the resistance. Reason for which my job was a good one because I did shift work. So, for example, two days for two days I worked at daytime and for two days I worked at night because the casino uh, was open very long, sometimes until one or two a.m. And uh, when I went to work for the night shift, then during the day I could go to school. And the lessons in the secret school um, didn't take place in one place only. Every now and then we would change the location. These were always private flats and uh, from time to time we moved to a different place um, just due to security reasons. Uh, we knew our teachers, but most of the time we didn't know their names, or at least their real names. It was the same with the colleagues, with the schoolmates. Uh, we, were, uh, we were told not to enter into very close relationships, so that we didn't know each other too well, just in case. Mm, this was what the secret school looked like and from the end of the year 1940 until 1942 I went to the secret school uh, and then in 1942 our entire group was arrested. And one day, so it happened that me and four other friends, four other colleagues from the school came to the place where the school should take place an hour earlier than we should. We should have been there at 6 p.m. We were there at 5 p.m. already. And then the Gestapo came and somebody must have denounced us. And unfortunately, with one of uh, my colleagues, they found some secret papers, some uh, information flyers that we were distributing. The seat of the Gestapo in Krakow uh, was placed in the Pomorska Street, and already back then it was a place that was very well known among the Polish population of the city, and it was very feared. Nastąpiły oczywiście przesłuchania śledztwa. Najpierw zostaliśmy za, zostaliśmy, bo tam byli koledzy, więc. And then uh, the colleagues, my colleagues and me were um, transferred to the prison in the Montalupi Street in uh, Krakow, and from there we were regularly taken to interrogation and investigation to the Gestapo seat in the Pomorska Street. Nie będę się wdawała w, szczegó wdawała w szczegóły, aby opowiadać, jak, jakie były przebiegi. I don't want to give you the details of these interrogations, because they were usually very, very brutal. Moja pierwsza wizyta na...
Pomorsky. I remember when I was in the Pomorska street for the first time, I heard someone screaming in the basement of the building and it was, it was, it was a horrible moment, it was a horrible feeling. Uh, the investigators, the Gestapo investigators didn't pay attention to whether the person they were questioning was a girl or a boy, they were equally brutal to everyone, there was, we were beaten, we were kicked, this was the usual interrogation method of the Gestapo. And fortunately I didn't really have anything to do with this information flyers, uh, but I knew, I actually knew that the, my colleagues were distributing these things. Um, I knew that they were part of the Polish underground movement because sometimes they would tell us stories, they would tell, give us information that wasn't meant for the public. They would give us information uh, about what was going on in the Western, on the Western Front, on the Eastern Front. Uh, and we knew that they only could have this sort of information from foreign radio stations. And the Gestapo probably understood that they wouldn't hear much from me because I didn't really know much. So um, that's why my investigation was a bit shorter than in the case of the others. Already after six weeks I was directed to a transport. Yeah. <coughs> um, we would like to hear about the visions and dreams for a future you had before the war when you were attending school mm -hmm. and a przed wojną jakie miała pani marzenia, plany na przyszłość? No tak jak młodzi ludzie, no. bardzo wiele rzeczy mnie interesowało, ale w gruncie rzeczy najbardziej interesowała mnie literatura. I think my dreams were like those of all young people. I had very many different dreams, but uh, what I was interested in most uh, was, I think, literature. I liked Polish literature very much, but also because I was learning German at school, I also got in touch with German literature and I actually liked it very much. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, my school had nothing to do with literature. It was a, a vocational school. It was a work school where we dealt with things like trade, like bookkeeping, but still I, I like literature. I, back then I even tried to write some poems and I think that I pre even preserved some of them until today. Just to get back to these poems, uh, in the year 1944, when I was in uh, the Auschwitz camp already, I had a job as a bookkeeper in the food stock and the kitchen of the camp. So I had access both to paper and to pencils. There were no pens back then. And in my free time, I did try to describe the reality, the everyday life of the camp uh, in poems. And uh, today I'm a little bit ashamed of those poems when I look at them, but still they did capture part of the reality of the camp. What are your memories of the transport, of the moment of arrival at the camp? 30 maja rano On the 30th of May, uh, one of the prison guards opened the door to our cell and said, "So gather your things. You're going to the trans. You're going on a transport." And she didn't give any further details. We didn't know what trans kind of transport she meant. So I asked her. The woman, this prison guard, she spoke, um, uh, she spoke Polish. She came from somewhere here in the area, here in this um, area. Many people also, many Polish people also spoke German. So it was a reminder of the Austrian times. 
Uh, and then when I asked, she told me that we were going to, to Oświęcim, to Auschwitz, and um, the name of Oświęcim was already in those times um, very negatively associated in Poland, so people already knew that this was a very, very dark place. My father, who was, as I said, a driver, was driving on a locomotive and, of course, worked during the war. Um, my father was working in the railway and he was driving trains himself as well um, and uh, during the war he continued to work in his job and I remember one day in the middle of the year 1940 he came home very very moved very irritated and uh, he told us that he was going with his train in the direction of Oświęcim, of Katowice. Um, and the, when, they when the train stopped in Oświęcim, he talked to some local people and they told him that uh, something had been built in the town, something like a horrible prison back then. We didn't even know the word camp. We didn't even know this term, but the people already knew that something was going on and they told him that people were dying there, that they were either murdered or dying of hunger and diseases. Um, um, what moved my father the deepest was the fact that uh, dead bodies, the other bodies of the people who died weren't buried on a graveyard like it should be, but they were burned somewhere in the fields. I remember that my reaction to his words, to his story was a bit hysteric. I told him that, that but this is impossible. I had known a bit about the German literature. I had, I had read some German literature. I had known a bit about German culture, or at least so I thought. And I told him that this is impossible. The Germans are a Christian nation. I'm sure they buried the dead people the way, the way it should be. It was only a few years later that I was to learn that not only the bodies of the de dead were burned, but also the living were chased in masses into gas chambers to be to be killed the way you kill insects. Jakie towarzyszyło Pani uczucie, kiedy pierwszy raz trafiła Pani do obozu, pierwszego dnia, w pierwszych chwilach w obozie? Właśnie, słuszne pytanie. A very good question. Ja, kiedy usłyszałam u straży... Uh, when I heard from this prison guard that we are going to Auschwitz, uh, I wasn't scared. I had heard about the place, but I wasn't scared. I thought that there could be nothing worse than the interrogation at the Gestapo, uh, the Gestapo building in the Pomorsko Street. I thought this would now finally come to an end and there, there can be nothing worse than that. And when I saw this gate that you all know, this gate that says Arbeit macht frei, so work makes you free, I was even quite optimistic. I thought, oh, if work can make you free, I'm not scared of work. I've been doing many things in my life before. I've been always helping my grandparents out uh, during haymaking in the, in the village. So I'm sure I will be free at some point because after all my case, my investigation wasn't a serious one. I wasn't accused of serious stuff like having a radio or forbidden books or something. So I thought there was no reason that I should stay in the camp longer than necessary. Um, but already from the first moments on when I crossed that gate, already beginning with the registration to the camp, I began to understand what kind of place this was. And first of all, we were directed to have a so-called 
hygienic or sanitary baths. And um, I don't know if you know, but the uh, women's camp in Auschwitz uh, wasn't an extra structure, it wasn't a separate structure, it was uh, divided from and uh, in the men's camp itself. So it was no separate structure, it was just a part of the men's camp that had been separated and there had been a, a women's camp. Um, that's why the uh, women's camp in, the, in Auschwitz, in the main camp, um, lacked some infrastructure that the men's camp had. For example, we didn't have showers like it was in the men's camp, but there was a room with two very huge bath tubes. Nasz był, przyjechałyśmy cały transport kobiet, właściwie przeważnie młodych dziewczyn z Montelupich, ponad 50. And uh, the transport I came with was a transport of only women, young, mostly young girls from this prison in the Montelupi Street in Krakow. Uh, and there were those two big bath tubes and we, had, we all had to go and take this sanitary bath in, this, uh, in those bath tubes, but the water was never changed and we were more than 50 people. No, ja widząc to, pomyślałam sobie żyć. So when I saw this, I, I thought to myself, you'd better try to avoid the sanitary bath. So I tried to uh, get to the very end of the line and hoped that nobody would notice that I wasn't in the bath. But unfortunately, this uh, had a bad ending for me. Ta funkcyjna, bo były to już funkcje rozdzielone, więźniarka, there were two functionary prisoners who were supervising the process of bathing because back then there were already function, uh, prisoner functionaries in the, uh, in the camp. And one of them was observing me and she saw, she must have noticed that I was trying to avoid the bath. And when all the other women had bathed already, I wanted to. Uh, go to them and just go along with them. She caught me and that was the moment when I got my first, when I was beaten for the first time in the camp. She beat me on the head and she forced me to go into the bath and this was my so-called camp baptism. Potem nastąpiła noc. Owszem, dostałyśmy tak zwaną kolację. Then we got some supper, which consisted of uh, a quarter of a loaf of bread, so a quarter of a kilo of bread, a tiny little bit of margarine, a little bit of a kind of a sausage I didn't know, I've never seen one like that before, and half a liter of some liquid that pretended to be tea. No, you know, niestety, no. I couldn't, this night, on the first night, I couldn't get any sleep because something happened that I did not suspect at all. There were hundreds and thousands of insects, these little insects that were biting you all the time and you had to scratch yourself all the time. You could get absolutely no sleep. Then we uh, were uh, woken up at uh, half past 3 a.m. And the block leader, um, the block leader ordered the so-called coffee hole. This meant that uh, a couple of the prisoners from the block had to get Blockage some other testing. liquid, some liquid that would Blockage serve at our breakfast. Blockage. This was the so-called block eldest. This was the prisoner, a prisoner functionary who had the function of a leader of the block. So. No, naturally, it was possible to drink that liquid. And on this day, this liquid, this coffee, was our entire breakfast because the day before, no one had told us that the bread we received the evening before should serve both as our supper and as our breakfast. Nobody told us that we wouldn't get any normal food in the, in the morning, so we all 
went to work hungry. Będę się skracać, bo to opowiadanie jak o, ka o, o każdym. Uh, I'll try to make it short because if I try to tell you about every single hour of this first working day in the camp, I think this will take too long. So on this first day we returned to the camp from work at 5 p.m. And at 1 p.m., although we didn't exactly know it because none of us had watches anymore, all of our belongings were taken, and we, there came a car from the camp which brought uh, our lunch in the form of some soup. On the day, the day before, um, all of us had received a um, small dish a small bowl and a wooden spoon which we had uh, we, car we carried with us it was attached to our belts and um, that's a uh, we uh, we got the uh, they poured their uh, they, they poured the soup into this dish uh, but it was very little it wasn't even half a liter and it also wasn't real soup it was more like water with a couple of maybe potatoes in it and as a result of all this, we had to, um, already on this very first day, we had to carry four people back to the camp because they, they were just too weak to uh, walk on their own because of hunger and because of uh, the hard work we were doing. And that's also exactly what the following day. And at the first work we were doing, the first work we were doing uh, consisted in um, preparing grounds to be um, to be soon again. So it, uh, well, the ground was frozen because it was winter; it was cold, and we had to hit the ground apart so that it isn't that hard and uh, and that concrete anymore. And when we were done doing this job, um, the next job we were um, uh, we were meant to do was to clear the uh, the river, the river Sawa from the water plants that covered the that covered the sides of the of the river. This work was quite practical because uh, there were a lot of bushes. Uh, growing at the banks of the Soa River. This meant that the guards weren't able to see and observe everyone uh, at the time, so you could uh, hide for a little while, beh while behind the bushes and take a little bit of rest. And then one day uh, when our commando, our work uh, was setting up to return to the uh, to the camp at 5 p.m. it turned out that one of the prisoners was missing and it was clear that she had escaped she had benefited from the fact that there were all the plants or the bushes and the, the SS guards couldn't see every single one working within the work group and I don't know, perhaps the uh, level of the river was very low so that she could just pass it or maybe she just swam very well, but anyhow she managed to escape. A horrible day, a horrible moment for us because we knew what happens in the men's camp in such a situation. We knew that when in the men's camp someone escapes from the work group, then the entire work group or perhaps even the entire barrack will be decimated. It meant that they would um, that they would land the whole work group, stand in line, and they would count like one, two, three, four, five, and every tenth person would be shot, just at random, as a punishment. And we were convinced that the same would happen to us. So I can't describe you what it's like when people are faced with such a situation. Uh, when we were told to stand in line, the women were fighting for the places, they were trying to count 
which place in the row would be every tenth one and they tried as much as possible to avoid this, this place. And then after about one horrible hour of waiting, an SS officer came uh, riding a horse, came from the camp. We were told that it was the commander of the, of the camp uh, and he told us to march back to the camp. On the way back to the camp, of course, we didn't feel any safer because we knew that they could still kill every tenth one of us in the camp. But then, perhaps because it was the first time that someone escaped from the women's camp, there was a decision, we were told that this was a decision that came from Berlin, that instead of killing every tenth one of us, the entire work group should be sent to the so-called punishment troop. And that was also what happened. The same day in the evening, we marched about four, uh, we marched about four kilometers from the main camp to the punishment uh, troop, which was placed in a village called Bude. We didn't get any supper that day. I remember one camp song, or a song that we used to sing in the camp that said that Birkenau was hell. But if Birkenau was hell, then Buddha was the absolutely lowest part of hell. You, you couldn't imagine how, how terrible it was there. The building we were supposed to live in was an old school building up in the village. It, has a, it had a big entrance hall, and on the floor of this entrance hall there were straw mattresses lying around with no blankets, and we were supposed to sleep on the straw mattresses, just on the mattresses without anything else. And the hunger in Buda was even greater than in Auschwitz because in Auschwitz we used to receive an additional bonus because the so-called hard labor work groups in Auschwitz, those that were working outside the camp, received the so-called Schwerarbeiterzulage once a week. This was a hard labor bonus. This was some extra food and in Budi we didn't get that. No, i do tego były naszymi przełożonymi kryminalistki, więźniarki niemieckie. The prisoner functionaries in Budy in the punishment troop were German criminal prisoners, female criminal prisoners. There were four of them, and I don't know, either they were born murderers or they had been trained really well and really brutal because. Uh, it was enough when an S one of the SS guards just hit one of the prisoners once and they would do the rest of the work. They would come up to this prisoner and they would finish this person off. They would just kill. Those functionary prisoners, uh, the prisoner functionaries in Buda, they weren't political prisoners. Those were all criminal prisoners. Uh, who mo or most of them had already spent many years in prison. We spent two months in Buda, our entire work group, and there were 200 of us when we, were, when we came to the punishment troop, and only 140, 143 returned to the camp after those two months. So this mean, means that during only two months, 57 of us, 57 women were either killed or died of hunger and diseases. We didn't return to the main camp of Auschwitz, but after the punishment troop in Budi, we were placed uh, at the newly opened, newly organized women's camp in Birkenau. 
Kuşuz gibi bir sıraş. All the days were were terrible there, and uh, which one was most terrible one? It's hard to say. It's very subjective. Ne strašnější jedna? When I first came to Bergno, it was actually quite good because Bergno had um, similar regulations as the Auschwitz main camp and uh, the positive difference to Auschwitz was that in Bergno uh, we, the Polish female prisoners, had the chance to work in work groups that were working inside the camp. <laughs> so we had the opportunity to join work groups that were not going out of the camp. Do tego czasu nie były Polki, tylko do tej najcięższych praw przeznaczone. Until the moment when I came to Birkenau, the Polish, prison, Polish female prisoners were only used for the hardest labor outside the camp. Uh, in Birkenau, I was directed to, um, I was accommodated in the block number seven. And the block eldest, so this block leader, was a Polish woman, and also the Stubendienst, which was the cleaning co uh, cleaning troop of the block. This was uh, these were also Polish women, all of them. To dawało nadzieję. Uh, so we could hope that they would be better to us. They would treat us better because we were Polish as well. Yes, she. During the first couple of weeks in Birkenau, I worked in a work group that did go outside for working. We did some work in the field. Uh, one day, when it was raining very, very hard, someone, I think maybe the Lager Eldest, so maybe the f prisoner functionary who functioned as camp leader, uh, ordered that the women in the camp uh, collect the mud from the main street in the camp and carry it outside. This was uh, work that had absolutely no sense because we had to load the mud on kind of a stretch, on kind of a carrier that we had to carry, but uh, the mud flew back to the ground from these carriers and it not only flew to the, uh, fell to the ground again, but it also fell on us, on our shoulders, on our jackets. But one day when we were done with the work a bit earlier, we were allowed to take a shower, like a real shower in the, in the so-called sauna. We also got fresh clothes that day. After the, we received the flash clothes, we still had some, there was still some time left until the evening roll call and uh, the uh, work groups that were working outside the camp weren't, weren't back yet. And then one of the Unterschaffführer, one of the SS officers came to our block, to block number seven. And uh, he told us to stand in line, so us, the, the women from the so-called Dreck Commando, so much work group. Um, At this time, when he was, at this point of time, when he came uh, to the block, I was already experienced enough to know when we are supposed to stand in line, that I should look for a place somewhere rather in the middle. Because uh, see, we, when we were standing in, we were always standing in a couple of lines, and you shouldn't uh, in a couple of rows, and you shouldn't stand in the first row, because then the chance was higher, the risk was higher that you would be selected to either do some especially hard job, or that you would be just selected to be shot or to go to the gas chamber somewhere, and you also shouldn't. Uh, stand on the sides because uh, the first rows on the side that was uh, where the dogs of the SS guards could attack you. So I was looking for a place in the middle, in some of the middle rows. 
Dlaczego ja w tym? I knew that I shouldn't stand in the first row, but for some reason, and until this day I don't know which reason, on this day I stood in the first row actually. And the SS officer was walking along the row and he was pointing at different women and he said like you, 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 and he pointed at me as well. I didn't know this SS officer. I have no, had never seen him before, and I didn't know what he was, um, what he was choosing us for. To mogło wróżyć coś najgorszego. It might have just as well been something terrible. But it turned out that this SS officer was head of the camp kitchen. He was looking for women for the so-called Schellküche. So he was looking for women who would peel the potatoes for the camp kitchen. And this very evening turned out to be my first step in the direction of surviving the camp. First of all, the work we did, we did it under the roof. We did it inside and this was a very important aspect if you want to survive. We were, we, all, we were also allowed to sit while we were working, so we were peeling the potatoes while sitting. And the camp cooks, so those who are concerned with the real cooking, would sometimes even bring us some food. Probably it was just thanks to this work, thanks to the fact that for two months in a row, I wasn't that hungry, I wasn't that tired. I could survive the typhus that I contracted in November 1942. And uh, so I survived the typhus, I, sur I survived the diarrhea. And then after surviving, after going through those um, illnesses, I returned to the kitchen. And for three more weeks I worked in this group which was peeling the potatoes and then the head of the kitchen chose me and a couple of other female prisoners to work in the proper kitchen. So to work with the kettles where the soup was, uh, where the soup was cooked. Because by then the tiffles had spread very widely in the camp and there was a real uh, epidemic of, of tifus in the camp and uh, there weren't enough women to work in the kitchen. The work in the kitchen wasn't as easy as it seems. The kettles of the soup were very heavy and we had to carry them out ourselves. So carrying out a kettle with 50 liters of soup uh, and with two people, just two women, was a hard job, but still the work in this work group in the kitchen uh, gave you a little bit more of a chance to survive. It's so nice. And the uh, good thing was that the entire kitchen work group was uh, transferred to another barrack. It was a wooden barrack where we didn't have to share our beds with four or five other people, but we had our own individual beds. And of course, while we were cooking the soup in the big kettles, we always had the opportunity to take a little bit of it away and, and eat. The kitchen work group had also the right to take baths or showers more often than the others, which was of course very important. To trwało kilka miesięcy. So I worked in this kitchen work group for a couple of months and then in June 1943 a group of female SS officers arrived in the camp. They came from different, from other concentration camps in Germany. And then my camp career, if I might call it that way, changed again. Pamiętam i zapamiętam do końca życia. I will remember this day for the, for the rest of my life, I think. That was the day when a new Aufseherin, a new SS, uh, a new SS uh, overseer came to the kitchen. 
we would have a female overseer from that um, from that time on. And she came to the kitchen together with the couple of the kitchen. The couple of the kitchen uh, was uh, a German prisoner uh, who had been in the camp for many, many years. She was called Steinhauser and she was okay. She wasn't bad. Uh, and I heard a conversation between them and the SS overseer uh, asked the couple if there is any woman in this uh, work group, if there's any woman in the kitchen who can understand some German. And then the couple, Bertha Steinhauser, pointed at me. She probably remembered that I had uh, translated her words to the other prisoners, or maybe it was just because they were just passing me by when, uh, when she heard the question. But anyway, she, she pointed at me. Um, then the, overseer, the SS overseer asked me, uh, where have you learned German? And uh, in co on contrary to the other SS overseers, she addressed the um, prisoners with the polite, for, with the German polite form. So she didn't say like you per name, but you like, you know. Yeah. So I told her that I had learned German at school. And then she told me, okay, then you will become my clerk. And this, this SS officer who chose me to become her clerk was Anneliese Franz. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Anneliese Franz had a bit of a different approach towards the prisoners than the other SS overseers. And how did the other female SS officers in the camp react to that, react to her? After a couple, after I had been working uh, together, let's say, together with uh, Anneliese Franz for a couple of months, I decided that um, she belongs to the second category of SS officers because I, for myself, divided the SS officers, both male and female, in the camp in three categories. The first category were those born murderers and sadists who really came to the camp in order to uh, ill-treat other people. Then there was the second category, uh, of those SS officers who only did what they were uh, supposed to do and nothing more, so they were no more and no less brutal than they had to. And then there was the third category, those SS officers who, even if something was wrong, even if the prisoners were doing something that was forbidden, who pretended not to notice it. And to me, Anneliese Franz be, uh, belonged to the second category, so she maybe didn't. Uh, so she maybe didn't do anything especially brutal. She just did what she had to do. No, coś, co się sprzeciwiało regulaminowi więźniarskiemu. When the prisoners were doing something against the rules, like taking this uh, in the kitchen work group, when they were, for example, stealing soup out of the kettle or just stealing, and it was very um, evident that, that they were stealing, then she would punish them. But otherwise, if everything was okay, if no one did anything wrong, she didn't persecute anyone. And she also never punished anyone herself. She never hit any of the prisoners. The only thing she did is when, was when something, someone did something wrong, she wrote the so-called meldung, she wrote a report. Uh, and I think during the entire time when she was the overseer of the camp kitchen, she only did it twice. Um, this day when she told me that I would become a clerk, and my first reaction was to tell her that I don't know what this job is about, and uh, I'm not sure if I can do it. 
But she told me, don't worry, you will learn. I następnego dnia sprowadziła z obozu męskiego do kuchni więźnia. And then the next day she brought a prisoner from the men's camp to the kitchen of the women's camp. And she told me, this prisoner is going to teach you bookkeeping. W czasie tej pierwszej naszej współpracy i tej lekcji przy takim On this first day during this first lesson that we had together sitting at a small table in the camp kitchen um, he managed to tell me and to explain to me that he had a function a job similar to mine in the uh, in the kitchen of the men's camp and he taught me where to write the numbers or to write the certain values how to calculate them and he he told me that he had been borrowed from the kitchen in the man's camp by my SS uh, overseer, so probably her rank was high enough so that she could organize something like that. This, this prisoner came to me, came to the kitchen for two more days. And then I had to deal with bookkeeping on my own. No, i tak było do końca. This was what I did until the end of the year 1943. Kiedy it was the end of the year 1944, and this was when uh, the Anneliese Franz, as well as the uh, commander of the camp and all the higher ranked SS officers left the camp because they were simply escaping for the, the front that was coming nearer. This is also the time when they started to transport the prisoners of the camps to the, uh, to the west, to Germany. And first of all, uh, men, the prisoners from the men's camp who were deported to Germany, and then also the women. The first transports were uh, transports of uh, Russian prisoners of war. Um, no, there were not many of them still there, but there were some, and uh, they also transported Russian women away. B1, B sector of the Birkenau camp was meant to be closed and we were transferred to section B2B. Uh, on the 5th of June 1945, we were evacuated in January 1945. Uh, we had to leave with a transport as well. The last months I spent in Ravensbrück and um, the last months uh, I spent uh, in the uh, camp of Ravensbrück. And it was, the camp was so full that they were, there was no place for us in the barracks and the blocks anymore. So we had to sleep under something that looked like a circus tent. Um, we, and we had to sleep on straw mattresses that were laid on a, a stone floor. And after three weeks, um, a part of my transport, like around 150 people, were sent to the satellite camp of Neustadt Gleve, where we were accommodated in uh, former military barracks that served for the air uh, defense before. But they were, when, when we were accommodated there, they had already been abandoned for some time. On the 2nd of May 1945, we were liberated by the Americans. And on the 8th of May, uh, together with a group of about 20 other women, uh, we started, we departed to Poland. There were no means of transport, so we had to go by foot. So can you remember of any uh, SS woman who was in your search? Czy pamięta Pani jakieś e, oficerki SS, które zaliczyła Pani do tej trzeciej kategorii? 
do tych, do, do tych, tak, do tej najlepszej. Tak. A, a Wizerin Becker też była szefową kuchni. No ja. A Wizerin Becker trafiła do, do naszej was, kuchni w 1944. Commanding officers of the camp kitchen. She came to the kitchen in 1944, and she mostly was on duty at night because the kitchen also worked at night. She came from Alsace, and uh, I, by the time I was pretty experienced in observing the staff of the camp, and I quickly understood that all in all, she was a good soul. And once or twice I dared to ask her if I could take some sugar for the children because there were two barracks in the in, in, Berk, in the camp of Birkenau where um, children were stay, uh, were accommodated. And it would always the conversation would always look the same. I would come up to her and say Oh please, can I have some? Could I have some sugar for the children? And she would say, No, this is uh, against the regulations. This is forbidden. I can't give you any. And I would say, But these children are so poor. They have nothing sweet. They have nothing to eat. Oh please. And she would say, But this is dangerous for and it's dangerous for you to to transport the sugar. But then in the end, she would always say, Oh okay, come with me. And then I had a little uh, bag made of out of material I had prepared already and she would give me some sugar and then I would take the bag and smuggle it to the to the barracks where the, where the children were. And she always said to me at the end when she had given me the sugar, she would always tell me, just don't <laughs> let them catch you. I need to explain to you that there were two so-called kinder blocks uh, in the camp of Birkenau. These were children barracks. These children were children of families that were um, deported from the region of Zamość. This is uh, southeastern Poland, actually quite near the Ukrainian border. Um, there the SS had had, um, had a big action uh, and they were burning down villages and settling people out of from there because um, there was a great partisan movement in this area. There were also some Ukrainian children in these blocks from Ukrainian villages. And these were really young children between four and let's say eight years of age. So in the women's camp itself there was nothing like a revolution. Of course there were some, I don't know, either individual women or I don't know if it was an organized, um, organized thing, but some of the uh, female prisoners did some forbidden things like writing down the names of those who died or were killed or received that deadly injection. Um, but there was nothing like an organized revolt. However, there was, for example, the revolt of the Zonda Commando, uh, which we could see actually from where we were. It was in 1944, and the crematory uh, where this uh, revolt of the Zonda, Co Zonda Commando took place was very close to the women's camp, so we actually. We could have seen it. Um, of course, back then, uh, when it happened, we had a Lagersperre, so this means we weren't allowed to leave the women's camp. Uh, but through the gates, uh, I could see the people escaping from, uh, from this crematory. I saw them running along the wire of, of our part of the camp. What I heard about, I didn't see it myself, but it was quite a quite known story in the camp, was when one single prisoner tried to, um, tried to revolt, tried to act. There was a transport that came and it was directed to the gas chamber, like instantly, directly. And one of the women, she probably knew, she probably knew what, understood what was going on. And then she attacked one of the SS officers and tried to take his weapon away. 
but uh, she didn't unfortunately she didn't succeed she was killed and from what i heard this the entire group that she came with was exposed to even more suffering as as usually because they um, they got a lesser a smaller amount of cyclone b when they once were sent into the gas chamber which means that they which meant that they were dying that they were suffering for a longer time but as i said i haven't seen it myself i only uh, heard these stories from uh, people from the zonda commando yeah. um during your time in the camp was there something you never stopped believing in Ja niechętnie nie odpowiadam na takie pytania, dlatego że this, I, I don't really like this kind of question because uh, I don't want to come across like someone who's fighting for some specific issue, but I understand that you didn't mean the question that way. Ja dlatego I am convinced until this day that I survived the camp because all the time I believed that I could not die here, that I could not die in the camp. And this was for a specific reason. Uh, in the fifth grade of primary school, we had um, a Catholic priest who was teaching us religion. And uh, he told us that for nine months at least, we should go to the uh, confess each first Friday of the month. We should confess and we should take the communion. Smart a kid as I was, I asked him, but why? Why should we do that? This, this um, Christ's teacher was uh, normally very severe and he didn't like it when we asked too much. But when I asked this question, he answered in a very calm and serious manner, if you do this, so if you confess and take communion for nine months in a row, it guarantees you that you won't die without receiving the sacraments. And it was not possible. In the camp it, was not po it wasn't possible to receive the sacraments. There was no church, there were no services. So I believed that I, I can't die in the camp because I can't receive the sacraments. When I, back then in primary school, I did what he told us to do and then for some time I forgot about it. I was reminded of um, what he said when in Birkenau when I saw a woman at the wire for the first time. You know that the wires were, uh, the barbed wire around the uh, camp was electrified and she decided just to commit suicide by walking into the wire. And this was a horrible experience for me, this was a horrible sight. But this was also the moment when I was reminded of this, when I thought to myself, but I can't die here because I can't receive the sacraments here, so I, I, I can't and I won't die here in the camp. And this thought uh, accompanied me the whole time. I survived typhus with it, I survived diarrhea with it, and it helped me stay alive. If it's true that believing can cause miracles to happen, then it was just it, it was a miracle. Mm, have you found new friends in the camp? And if you have, how important um, has it been to you? It was the most important thing, actually. For the first time, I understood how uh, important friendship was in the camp when we were at the punishment troop in Budde. Our task there was to um, clean some little lakes, clean some lakes from water plants. Uh, during the, uh, the during this work, we had to stand in water that went us up to here somewhere, and our task was to load the water plants that we took out from the water on some kind of carrier and to carry them out. And there were always two people needed to carry such a carrier with these water plants on them. And uh, so I always had shared this carrier with a girl, young girl from Krakow. Later I 
found out that she had uh, studied at a music school. She actually could play the violin very beautifully. Przy mnie wyglądała jak dziecko. Bardzo, bardzo no, niewielka, w każdym razie niższa ode mnie. In comparison to me, she looked like a little child. She was small, she was very thin. I to ona, ja w pewnym momencie powiedziałam, ja już w tej pracy... But still it was her who supported me when we were doing that job. I was... In some point, I arrived at um, I arrived at a point where I said, "Okay, I'm staying here. I'm staying in the water. Just let them shoot me. I don't care anymore." Because um, when the prisoners that were working in this lake didn't come out of the water, then the SS guards would shoot them. And it was. Uh, and uh, but she would always tell me, "Oh, please, don't give up. Just another 15 minutes. Think about it. It's only 15 minutes." Of course, we didn't have watches, so we didn't know when actually 15 minutes went by. But at some point, then I would say again, "Oh, continue on your own. I don't care. Let them shoot me." And she would always say, "You've already lasted 15 minutes. So another 15 minutes. It's not so difficult. You're gonna make it." And then at the end of the day, she would tell she would tell me, "You see, we survived. I told you we would." And that's how we managed together. It was it was her. It was this little girl whose fingers were like the legs of a bird. It was her who helped me survive, although I looked so huge and uh, huge and powerful in comparison to her. And for me, this was the first example of how a man's will and man's uh, or woman's uh, inner power can help survive the most difficult moments. The second time when I experienced it, it was already in Birkenau, and by then, uh, at the time I was I was sick. I was sick with the so-called Durchfall, which meant diarrhea, and it was in the. Uh, in the circumstances of the camp, it was uh, just as uh, deadly as, as the typhus was. It was in November 1942, I contracted typhus, and the administra administration of the camp decided that um, there should be actually a, a camp hospital also for the women's uh, for the women's camp because before there was a kind of a hospital for the women's camp but it was a place rather meant for dying and in 1942 the administration of the camp decided to after all uh, organize um, organize a hospital where people could be actually cured as well it's because the um, typhus had spread so widely in the camp that it uh, was not only dangerous for the prisoners, but it also became dangerous for the SS staff of the camp. The lies, those insects that spread typhus were basically everywhere, and for them it was no difference if they bite a prisoner or an SS officer, so it was equally dangerous to all. And uh, from among the SS, the female SS officers that had uh, direct contact with the with the prisoners, three contracted typhus and two died. So in order to set up a camp hospital um, for the women's camp, and the administration of the camp sent a group of doctors. And so it just were all prisoners, uh, but they were all professional doctors. We studied medicine. I was already cured from typhus, but then I got another equally deadly sickness, the, the diarrhea that I mentioned already. It's a very dangerous illness because basically you were bleeding all the time. It was, uh, was bloody diarrhea and you could just as well die from it. I was in block number 24 and uh, two doctors would always come to that block. One of them was a bit older, a bit more experienced, maybe about 40 years of age. And the other one was a young doctor, his assistant, who was a student of medicine. They could hardly do anything because there was simply no medicine. But they tried and they tried everything they could. 
Dr. And uh, this older uh, doctor, Dr. Monkowski, I remember his name and I even wrote a short story about him um, later. He saw that I was in a very bad state, he saw that I was too weak to even raise my hand and then he told me, please make it through this one last night and in the morning I will bring you some medicine. The uh, doctors before the roll call in the evening, they would always return to the men's camp because they needed to be present at the roll call there. And they uh, came back in the morning. And this night, uh, it was for me possibly about the same like a prisoner who is sentenced to death and is waiting for uh, is waiting for his execution on the next day. <coughs> Finally, in the morning, I heard the gong that meant that the uh, prisoners were to get up, and I was waiting for the doctors to come back to the women's camp. Dr. Monkowski przyszedł, podszedł do mojej koi z taką buteleczką. And Dr. Monkowski really came that day, and he brought me a small bottle, gave me a bit of the substance of the liquid that was in it on a spoon, and then he told me, so I will leave you this bottle here, and if I'm not here, take it, you should take it three times a day and three times at night. So on this day, uh, Dr. Monkowski gave me the medicine himself. At night, I, I took it myself. And on the next day, I, was, I began to recover. So in the next of the day, uh, he was giving me the medicine, and like I was taking it myself. And on the third day, I had improved so much that he told me, you see, I told you you would be healthy again. I assistant. And one day, only the young assistant doctor came and uh, he told me that uh, Dr. Mongoski had to undergo a revision uh, when, when he was entering the women's camp and uh, they found some medicine that he was smuggling for someone else. Ten assistant powiedział mi, and this young doctor told me that before the SS officers took Dr. Mankowski away, he told him to tell me that I should take the, what was in the bottle until the bottle is empty. Everyone thought that, the doctor, that they would shoot the doctor. Uh, however, he was a really very, very good doctor and probably the administration of the camp decided that they don't want to get rid of someone who knows what he's doing. So he only got, um, he got 25 hits, this was the usual uh, punishment and he got uh, 10 nights at the so-called Stehbunker, so he didn't spend the nights in his block, but he spent the nights standing in a little cell. Ale po nocy miał przychodzić do pracy. And he did come to work, he did come to the hospital, and this was good because um, the women who were in charge of the hospital block, um, they always could organize for him that he had some place where he could, where he could take some sleep or some rest. Uh, Dr. Monkowski survived the camp and after the war I've been trying to find him and to say thank you for saving my life. Um, finally one of the nurses that I knew from the I met one of the nurses that I knew from block number 24 during a meeting of uh, former uh, Auschwitz prisoners that took place in Warsaw we met we met there and I told her about I asked her about Dr. Monkowski whether she knew what had become of him and she told me, oh, he's working in Szczecin, he's working in one of the hospitals. 
At first I was a bit sad, but then I thought this man has saved so many lives. I have I don't know for how many people he smuggled all this medicine, how many people he saved. So how come would he could he remember me? And I'm well aware that without the friendship, without the support of certain people, I wouldn't have survived the camp. Let me go. In the post-war time, and there was a book, it was, I think, the first book on the concentration camp of Auschwitz that uh, was published. It was a work by an excellent, by the excellent Polish writer called Tadeusz Borowski. This was a beautiful book, an excellent book, and I read it and I liked it very much, but there was one thing I was missing in this book. There was no moment of human solidarity, of this humanity that, without which you couldn't survive in the camp. The world he was describing was a cruel world and there was no exception in this cruelty. But without even a single spark of hope, you couldn't have survived. I have one last question for the end of the meeting. When and why did you return to the former camp? Były trzy etapy właściwie takie mojej decyzji. I could say there were three phases um, of the of this decision the, to 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 return there. The first one was back in 1945, and it was let's say a forced visit for some kind because my mom wanted me to show her uh, where I was living during my stay in in the camp. She we came to Bergno and I showed her the block number 27, so it was actually the infirmary, the hospital, where I was uh, lying when I was sick with typhus. Back, back then all the barracks that were still there were open, you could just walk in and out. I showed my mother the wooden bed on which I was lying in the hospital and she looked at it and asked me, you call this drawer a bed? And then when she saw this uh, black and black and black, no, she didn't want to, she didn't ask any more questions, she didn't want to look at anything else. Um, so I decided that on the way back we would also um, have a look at the main camp to maybe make her impression a bit better because after all the main camp looked a bit, uh, made a bit of a better impression than the camp in Birkenau. So we entered, when we entered the first block, I saw, to my great surprise, in one of the rooms there were a lot of documents, pictures, lists laying on the ground. And there were three men who were looking at those documents, were sorting them, selecting some of them. And I asked them what they were doing. And they told me, we were trying to save the documents that weren't destroyed or taken away by the Red Army yet. We were trying to preserve some memories. And uh, in this moment I thought I should look for some, I should look for some work because um, after the war, when I came back home after the liberation, my, I found my mother and my brother living in very poor conditions. My father had been shot in 1943 while he was working. And I needed to, I wanted to finish my education, I wanted to do my maturity exam, but I knew I needed to find a job in order to support my family. Może bym tutaj dostała pracę, ponieważ musiałam pracować, żeby właśnie pomóc ciotki.
I thought maybe I could work here and help them out with sorting out those documents. So I asked those men who were also, all three of them were former prisoners as well. I asked them if maybe I could get a job here and help them out. And one of them asked, uh, asked me, how old are you? I told him I was 22. He asked, have you passed your maturity exam yet? I told him, no, I couldn't do my maturity exam because of the war. And he told me, go and get an education. You have a whole life ahead of you. This was his decision and I, I was crying when I left the main camp. But on the other hand, on this day, he showed me the way that I was to go for the rest of my life. However, I could not forget these people that had stayed in here in Oświęcim, Auschwitz, out of their own free will. I thought about them all the time. Later I got a job at, at the Department for Literature of the Polish Radio. And when I got this job, one of my tasks was to write a report, uh, make a report about the creation of the museum, of the memorial site Auschwitz-Birkenau. And I gave my report a title that uh, I found in the guest book of the memorial site. This sentence that I found in this guest book uh, said, this is the ground where the dead are most present. And the uh, original text I, in the guest book was actually in French. It was written by a French tourist. And then this, was the, this uh, report was the first step. Later on, years passed, things developed. I wrote the book, the, the, I wrote the, the Passenger and other books. And when the International Youth Meeting Center was created, I started coming to Oświęcim more and more often to meet with, with groups, with young people. And uh, we started a very intensive cooperation. And so here I am being here in and with the center until today. <laughs> I just have a little thing to ask you for, because, uh, I haven't been active as a writer for a couple of years already, the Christ of Auschwitz was my last novel, and uh, meetings with young people like you are right now the, what fills my life most. And I would like to ask you that you carry this memory further once you are in there. Don't let this memory die, because I think that we owe it to all those people who died here, to all those people whose blood the grass in Oświęcim grows on. So please, just don't let the memory fade away.